Hi there. Thanks for coming. Can everyone hear me okay? For those of you who don't know me, my name is John Grebar. I'm a cardiologist here at Holland Hospital. And today's uh, topic is vascular health more than hypertension and cholesterol. And in particular, what I'm going to be talking about is the most common form of a vascular condition called atherosclerosis. And with atherosclerosis, this is a really a body-wide syndrome that affects essentially every organ system in our body. And in particular, we're going to talk about heart disease, peripheral vascular disease, which means atherosclerosis in any organ other than the heart, and cerebrovascular disease, or stroke. And then the last part of the talk is going to be about prevention. So to begin with, atherosclerosis, uh, what is it? Has, uh, can I see a show of hands how many people have heard of atherosclerosis? Okay, so that's pretty good. That's doing better than the national average. <clears throat> and how, how many people here feel that they're at risk for atherosclerosis by a show of hands? Oh, that's better than that national average too. Great. <laughs> And how many here can identify six risk factors for atherosclerosis? Okay, so two hands and I think I work with them. <laughs> so that's good. Now the other four people here from my office who didn't raise their hand, <laughs> there's going to be additional lectures. So hopefully by the end of the talk, everyone here is able to identify at least three, if not uh, six risk factors for atherosclerosis. So this is from a national survey. Less than two-thirds of the, the population was able to, uh, had ever heard of the term atherosclerosis, and then only one in five people felt they were at risk for atherosclerosis or could identify um, six risk factors for atherosclerosis. So atherosclerosis, just real broadly and generally speaking, it's hardening of the arteries. And in the United States, it's the leading cause of death. And basically, hardening of the arteries relates to plaque formation or the accumulation of cholesterol within the wall of the arteries in the heart, the kidneys, the bowel, the arteries in the neck, the arteries in the brain. It can happen anywhere. So what, what are these plaques and uh, what's in them? Well, atherosclerosis is a chronic inflammatory syndrome which begins in the first decade of life and it affects the arterial blood vessels. These are the blood vessels that take the blood away from the heart and deliver it to the organs. And why this is important is because the arterial blood vessels deliver essentially oxygen or nutrients to the organ systems, the heart, the brain, the legs. And what happens with ather atherosclerosis is it's a chronic inflammatory condition which is mediated through the inner lining of the blood vessels called the endothelium. And this inflammatory response uh, is triggered by a variety of factors and occurs essentially throughout our lifetime. The result of this inflammation is the development of a plaque. And this occurs uh, through an inflammatory reaction mediated by what are called white blood cells. And these are the infection fighting cells that are in our body. And they also fight off the response of the inflammation within the artery wall. So the accumulation of white blood cells within the arteries is, is termed the fatty streaks. And basically this is the response of these infection fighting cells to the deposition of cholesterol initially on the, the inner surface of the artery and then eventually actually in the artery wall. And these fatty streaks eventually erode into the artery wall and develop into plaques which contain both living and dead elements. The living elements would be the active in, uh, white blood cells which are fighting the inflammation and trying to remove the cholesterol. Unfortunately, as the, the cholesterol sits in the artery wall, it becomes organized and uh, forms uh, eventually crystals, then scar tissue, and can eventually become uh, calcified. And these changes within the artery wall lead to a, lo a loss of elasticity, which contributes to the development of hypertension. So when we think about atherosclerosis, it's not just the development of plaques within the artery walls that we worry about. It's the development of related conditions such as hypertension. So what are the components of a plaque? This is a sample uh, from a carotid artery dem demonstrating a plaque. I think I have a pointer here. This is the artery as it comes up from through the neck and it gives off two branches at this Y point. 
This is typically where a plaque forms, and this is the plaque right here, the protruding into the, the lumen or the uh, blood carrying space of the artery. Arteries are basically uh, configured like pipes, and as they approach our various organs, our heart, our brain, they have a configuration like a tree, a main branch, and then it gives off sub branches and so on. So the components of this plaque, there are three main components. The endothelium, and this is the most important component. This is the, basically the regulator of um, the development of a plaque. And endothelial dysfunction is the main common pathway by which plaques develop. Once you develop endothelial dysfunction, you, develop, you can develop a fatty streak and eventually an atheroma, which is basically a, a lump of gruel. It's from the Greek word athra. And it's a nodular accumulation of essentially fat within the artery wall. This occurs over the first 10 to 20 years of life and can slowly progress throughout our lifespan. And at the outer margins of the plaque, there can become cholesterol crystals, scar tissue, and calcification. So this figure depicts a normal human artery, which is basically, like I mentioned earlier, a pipe. And it's lined by an inner layer, the endothelium. And it covers all the inner layer, of, inner layer of all of our blood vessels. And it regulates the health of this arterial wall. For a variety of factors, the most two common factors would be diabetes, which results in metabolic changes within the endothelium, as well as smoking, which basically makes the endothelium more porous Cholesterol can penetrate the endothelial wall and get into the inner layer called the, between the endothelium and the intima, as well as the inner layer, which is the um, media. Within this middle layer of the artery wall, inflammatory cells such as macrophages, which are infection-fighting cells, as well and is a form of a white blood cell, try to attack the cholesterol and remove it. But this inflammatory response also recruits smooth muscle cells, which lead to collagen uh, deposition, which is a connective tissue in response to the cholesterol. This is how the uh, plaques become organized and become tough, almost like scar tissue. And then over many, many years, these plaques can become calcified at the outer margins. As the plaque progresses, the uh, inner layer, the endothelium, also becomes fibrous and develops a, uh, what's referred to as a fibrous cap. So this is another depiction of an artery. And the most important part of atherosclerosis, again, is it's the result of chronic endothelial dysfunction, which essentially occurs throughout our lifespan. And the initial, the initial dis disturbance in this endothelial uh, function or this barrier to the Development of atherosclerosis occurs as early as the first decade of life. Here you can see a, a normal, healthy appearing endothelium. And then a fatty streak develops with the deposition of cholesterol on the inner surface of that endothelium. And then as endothelial dysfunction progresses with diabetes or high blood pressure, high cholesterol, a variety of factors, uh, flow disturbances related to the configuration of the arteries is believed to play a role. There are many, many factors which do lead to the development and progression of a, a fatty streak to an atheroma, then eventually a fibroatheroma, which is basically this plaque containing scar tissue, and then ultimately potentially a complicated lesion. And this occurs over 40, 50, 60 years. Initially, the growth of these plaques is largely driven by the addition of cholesterol or fat into the artery wall. And then over the um, subsequent 20 to 40 years, these plaques become organized, develop scar tissue, become fibroatheromas, and eventually calcification. So as I mentioned, as the plaque progresses, there's two main things we worry about. As I, as I mentioned earlier, these are basically pipes within our body that develop, uh, deliver oxygen to the various organ systems. As these plaques de develop, there's two things we worry about. 
One, whether the plaque is narrowing the artery down and restricting the delivery of oxygen. This is referred to as stenosis or blockage. The second issue we worry about is whether these plaques are growing to such a degree that they become unstable and become complex lesions which may rupture and cause a heart attack or stroke. And this is an example down here where you have, uh, you have a complex blockage with a large amount of cholesterol and for a variety of reasons the endothelium becomes disrupted. When the endothelium becomes disrupted, the components under the endothelium, the uh, cholesterol is exposed to the blood. The cholesterol is extremely irritating. It activates the clotting components within the blood, leading to the formation of a blood clot or thrombus. And this is the inciting event uh, that causes a heart attack. On the right here is an example of a, a plaque that's progressed over many, many years with a larger amount of cholesterol, infection-fighting cells, the white blood cells, and has severely narrowed the uh, artery and is restricting blood flow. So in the heart, with a restriction in blood flow, patients will develop what's referred to as angina. Initially, angina occurs with, uh, when the, the heart requires more oxygen for strenuous activity, such, a, such as exercising. The blockage prevents the delivery of oxygen, and patients would typically develop chest pain. As the blockage progresses, the level of activity that provokes chest pain becomes lower and lower to the point where some patients develop chest pain without any activity. And this would represent a very, very severe blockage. In the legs, the same process occurs. And this is termed claudication, which is basically angina in the legs. With the development of a blockage, blood flow is restricted. And with activity, such as exercise, going up steps, regular daily activities, mowing the lawn, there's inadequate blood flow or oxygen delivery to the muscles in the legs and discomfort then uh, ensues. The other, so that's, that's the concern with developing a stenosis. The other thing we worry about is what, what I mentioned earlier is plaque rupture. There's different types of plaque rupture that can lead to the formation of a blood clot on the artery wall. In the heart, this causes a heart attack. This occurs in the carotid artery. It would cause a stroke. And there's three main mechanisms by which this occur. The first is by the uh, development and accumulation of fat within the artery wall. It's felt that the more cholesterol you have in a blockage, the higher your risk of that blockage basically breaking open and causing a heart attack is. The second type of mechanism is less well understood, but for a variety of reasons, there may not be a large amount of cholesterol in the artery wall, but that inner lining, the endothelium, will become eroded and allow blood to interact with the underlying components. Even though there may not be a large amount of cholesterol there, this erosion in, of the inner lining will, will be adequate to trigger a heart attack. And the third mechanism, is related to calcification in the artery wall. And as the plaque progresses and develops a significant amount of calcification, some of the calcification may be exposed to the blood or protrude through that inner layer, that inner protective layer called the endothelium. And the presence of calcification within the uh, inner uh, aspect of the artery creates a tendency for blood clots to form and potentially a heart attack. So moving on to heart disease, which is one form of atherosclerosis, which is one area where we most commonly hear about atherosclerosis. There's a lot of statistics up here, and the one statistic I really want to focus on about atherosclerosis in the heart or heart disease is this one over here. 27% of people who recognize the signs of a heart attack call 911. And this is similar to what we're seeing here at Holland Hospital. When patients feel that they're having a heart attack, they're having chest pain, they're having shortness of breath, they're having symptoms that are concerning to them, most of the time, unfortunately, they're having their loved ones drive them in. Certainly coming in is the right thing to do, but having your friends or family drive you in is the wrong thing. And the reason is because with a heart attack, the blockage in the heart artery sets up a, a large amount of electrical irritability. 
And this irritability is frequently what leads, to pe leads people to pass away from a myocardial infarction or a heart attack. So again, more and more statistics here. One, there's one heart attack every second. There's one death from a heart attack every minute. And getting back to what I just talked about, of those who have a heart attack, one in six to one in three people die from it without ever reaching the hospital. And this is potentially a treatable condition. Again, getting back to this electrical irritability, it sets up potentially fatal irregular heart rhythms that without emergency resuscitation are unfortunately very, very frequently fatal. So I asked this question earlier, how many people here felt they were at risk for develop the development of heart disease? A large proportion of you were, and that's what's been shown in multiple, multiple studies. This is from the Framingham Heart Study, which was a study done about now probably over 30 years ago. And looking at people who were age 40 to 49, or age 40, I'm sorry, age 40, the lifetime risk of developing heart disease was nearly 50% in men and 30% in women. For those people who made it to 70 with no heart disease, the risk remained high at 35% for men and 24% in women. Again, more statistics on the significance of atherosclerosis in the heart. Coming from this study, almost half the men who have a heart attack under the age of 65 pass away within eight years. So what is heart disease? Well, it, it comes in two varieties it was, as we talked about earlier. And the goal of treatment is really to prevent symptoms, particularly related to poor blood flow or angina caused by these blockages that develop over many, many years. And the second goal, and probably the most, arguably the most important goal, is to prevent a heart attack. So getting back to what we talked about earlier here, the two flavors of heart disease. Plaque rupture occurs when a blockage for one of the, because of one of the three mechanisms we discussed earlier triggers what's referred to as plaque rupture and the formation of a blood clot within the artery wall. And the other type of heart disease is related to blockages, which allow inadequate blood flow to get to the heart muscle. So frequently, as a cardiologi cardiologist and an interventional cardiologist, when we check people's heart arteries, we get asked, how severe was the blockage that we had? What caused my heart attack? How bad was it? Was it 70%? Was it 90%? Was it 99%? Well, most heart attacks actually occur in arteries with only mild to moderate blockages. And getting back to why this occurs is because it's not necessarily the restriction in blood flow that causes the heart attack. It's a completely different mechanism. It's plaque rupture. So looking at this uh, the part of the figure here on the right, this is um, looking at, of all patients with a heart attack, they combined four studies here. Nearly two-thirds of heart attacks occurred in arteries with less than a 50% blockage. Tw approximately 20% occurred in arteries with a moderate blockage, 50 to 70% blockage. And only 14% of heart attacks occurred in arteries with greater than a 70% blockage. So really, the, the important question is not how severe the blockage is, but it's really how many blockages do I have, how much atherosclerosis do I have? Because that's really what creates the risk for having not just a heart attack, but a vascular event. So the goal of treatment is to address the disease, which is atherosclerosis, not the blockage. And this is a little bit a matter of statistics as well, because there are far more non-obstructive blockages, meaning blockages less than 70%, then there are severe blockages. And again, it gets back to the more atherosclerosis you have, the higher an individual's risk for having a heart attack is. So the second form of atherosclerosis I want to touch on is peripheral arterial disease. This refers to atherosclerosis in any other organ system other than the heart, including cerebral vascular disease or stroke, but I'm going to talk about that separately. So peripheral arterial disease, unlike coronary artery disease or heart disease, 
Most commonly, symptoms occur from stenosis, narrowing of the arteries, rather than plaque rupture or thrombosis. So symptoms of peripheral arterial disease, it depends on the organ system involved. The common theme is that the organ system is not getting adequate blood flow. In the brain, most commonly the symptoms are related to poor blood flow to the brain. So in, in this case, it's typically the symptoms of a stroke. Dizziness, confusion, weakness on one side of the body, slurred speech, coordination problems, vision difficulty. If there's poor blood flow to the abdomen, which is typically the bowel. The most common symptoms, pain or discomfort after eating, typically 15 to 30 minutes after eating. Again, this is related to inadequate blood flow. Once we eat, our gut wants to digest the food. The body's uh, very smart and one has mechanisms to increase flow, but if there's a blockage, flow cannot be increased and it provides feedback uh, to us in the uh, sense of discomfort. In the legs, if there's severe blockages in the arteries providing blood flow to the muscles in the legs, the most typical symptoms are discomfort when we're doing activities. As the um, condition progresses, as the blockage progress, you, patients can go on to develop uh, cold toes and feet, skin changes, or ultimately ulcerations. Blockages in the arteries to the kidneys can cause a variety of different symptoms. Uh, but most commonly, it'll be high blood pressure that's particularly hard to uh, control. Patients may require four, five, or six medications to control their blood pressure. It may uh, cause sudden onset of uh, high blood pressure when a patient's previously not had high blood pressure. And in rare cases, it can cause sudden shortness of breath related to fluid accumulation. So heart disease gets a lot of attention, and I, I, mean, I could show you lots and lots of uh, concerning statistics about heart disease. But peripheral vascular disease actually carries a more uh, concerning prognosis. So this is looking at patients with peripheral vascular disease, or PVD, compared to patients with cancer. As you can see here, over approximately a four-year span, this is their uh, survival they have nearly equal uh, prognosis. On the right here is a figure with survival versus uh, approximately 10 years. And the ABI is a measure of peripheral, the severity of peripheral vascular disease. As the disease becomes more severe, prognosis becomes worse. So what about peripheral vascular disease with what relation to heart disease? Which, which one do you think is worse? Votes for heart disease, Just by a show of hands. Votes for peripheral vascular disease. Yes, that's exactly right. Peripheral vascular disease has a much worse prognosis than patients with isolated coronary artery disease. So again, looking at survival here on the left versus a 13-year follow-up period. In the red line here, survival with coronary artery disease, approximately 70% at 13 years. Isolated coronary disease. And looking at patients with very various forms of peripheral vascular disease, these are patients who've had a carotid endarterectomy, so they have significant blockages in their neck. LLR is lower limb revascularization. These patients have had significant blockages in their legs. And AAA is peripheral vascular disease affecting the main blood vessel in the body called the aorta within, uh, within the abdomen. And AAA is uh, abdominal aortic aneurysm. So, just kind of ignoring this purple line here, this is a ruptured AAA. So certainly patients who have a ruptured aorta have a very poor early prognosis. A rupture of the main blood vessel in your body, uh, obviously these patients are gonna do very poorly in the short term. But in looking at these other three other groups, as you can see at 13 years, their, their survival is approximately 15%, 50, I'm sorry, 50% significantly worse than patients with isolated coronary disease. So moving on to stroke, just want to touch on stroke because it is an important form of atherosclerosis and traditionally strokes thought of basically it comes in one of three types, thrombotic stroke, embolic stroke, and cerebral hemorrhage. And this is how it's classically thought of. So thrombotic stroke, meaning a blood clot forms in the brain 
Embolic stroke, meaning a blood clot or a piece of material such as plaque, travels to the brain, blocks the blood vessel and restricts blood flow. And cerebral hemorrhage, which is basically bleeding into the brain. And this can come from various, cerebral hemorrhage can result from various mechanisms, one of which would be an aneurysm. Another potential cause would be related to hemorrhagic conversion of one of these two types. So in looking at this, this is a, a, an older, um, older data, actually from uh, 1978, 84% of strokes were ischemic strokes. But as I mentioned earlier, the problem with strokes, or the issue with atherosclerosis is it's not just atherosclerosis, it's the changes that result from atherosclerosis, including hypertension. And when you look at hypertension, as well as ischemic strokes, which result from atherosclerosis, essentially nine of 10 strokes are related to disease, uh, disease process from atherosclerosis. So 90% of strokes are from atherosclerosis. So prevention, how do we prevent these three forms of vascular disease? Well, the first important thing to do is to recognize that this is really an overlap syndrome. And atherosclerosis most commonly present, presents and gets the most attention when it presents as coronary artery disease. But it also presents as uh, cerebral vascular disease, or CVD, and peripheral arterial disease, or PAD. And here you can see the patients with um, both peripheral arterial disease and coronary artery disease, nearly 40%. Those who have all three, it's four, uh, 14%. And uh, cere uh, cerebral vascular disease and PAD without coronary disease, it's actually quite unusual, and it's about 10%. So the goal is to treat this systemic syndrome, not to specifically treat heart disease or peripheral vascular disease. And unfortunately, atherosclerosis probably doesn't get the attention it deserves. Plane crashes make headlines every day. Unfortunately, 2,000 Americans crash to death every day from heart attacks and strokes. The economic burden of this is $1.2 billion per day. So in thinking about prevention, this is heart disease death rates throughout the United States. The highest mortality is in the deepest uh, is depict, depicted by the uh, deepest uh, red color, typically here in the uh, southeastern United States, as well as somewhat through the northeast here. So why is there so much variation? There's, this, there's a lot of thought and theories on why this occurs. But I, I think w one thing that uh, no one would debate is that there's a lot of opportunity uh, reflected by this variation. We're not all really that different. There really shouldn't be this much variation in uh, heart disease uh, death rates. This is a treatable and preventable condition. So as cardiologists, we think about prevention in um, a couple of basic ways. In, in evaluating a patient and their risk for a vascular event, the first thing we think about is whether these patients have ever had a vascular event. If a patient's never had a vascular event, they've never had a heart attack, never had a stroke, don't have um, peripheral vascular disease or claudication, it's considered primary prevention. And in assessing patients for primary prevention, we look at their risk factors, we look at their age. Risk factors include things like high blood pressure, high cholesterol, sometimes their family history, diabetes, smoking. And there are multiple ways to estimate risk. The most common way is to use a variety of risk calculators. This is a risk calculator that was just came out from the American College of cardiology in 2014. And with the development of this risk calculator within the last couple of years, it changes the focus on prevention of a heart attack, which was previously the focus of many uh, risk calculators, to really recognizing that this is a systemic syndrome and we need to include all vascular events, particularly stroke and vascular death. So. These are some other things we think about when we evaluate a patient who's never had a vascular event. And in, particularly, in particular, what we're thinking about is how aggressive we should be in treating them with the addition of medications. Sure. So this is real easy to find. If you, you put in ACC risk calculator, it's one of the first, thing that, first things that come 
up on Google. And if you know your um, blood pressure and uh, some simple cholesterol numbers, uh, you should be able to calculate your risk. So this patient, 60 years old, their cholesterol, total cholesterol was 230, HDL was 40, systolic blood pressure was 150. They were on no medications for treatment of hypertension, so they probably have new hypertension that's untreated. They're a smoker, not diabetic, it's a male. 23 percent risk of having a vascular event at 10 years. He's, this patient would be considered high risk. So what about most people it's not so clear. Most people that we see fall under this intermediate risk category if they've never had a vascular event. So what do we think about? Well, well the first thing that comes to mind is family history and in particular because heart disease and vascular disease is so common. The presence of a vas uh, a heart attack within the family history is not necessarily significant unless it's what's considered premature coronary disease, meaning a heart attack in a male less than 55 or a female less than 65. This would increase an individual's risk of having a vascular event. The other things we could consider looking at are CRP. This is a blood test that looks at inflammation. Uh, this is an ultrasound test, uh, carotid intimal medial thickness um, that looks at the thickness of the arterial wall within the carotid artery. It's one way to determine whether a patient has early signs of atherosclerosis. Within the heart, a coronary artery calcium score can be performed. Again, this is another means by which we can try to detect atherosclerosis. Certainly, if we're finding atherosclerosis, we're going to be much more aggressive with uh, risk factor modification. We can perform an ABI, which is a simple blood pressure cuff study that's performed on the arms and legs to look for peripheral vascular disease. Again, any evidence of vascular disease, we're much more aggressive with risk factor modification. So I said there's two ways we think about patients in really determining their risk for a vascular event, primary prevention and secondary prevention. This is the second way. If a patient's had a heart attack, stroke, or has peripheral vascular disease, they're at a much higher risk for having a second event. This, is this figure is looking at patients who have had a heart attack. The heart attacks occurred at a target lesion, and they certainly have other blockages which did not cause the heart attack. Within the first year, the risk of a recurrent event is 30%. 18% related to the target lesion, 12% to the non-target lesion. Once someone's had a heart attack, we're extremely aggressive with modifying their risk factors for having another event. Very aggressive with lowering cholesterol, lowering blood pressure, smoking cessation is a must, diabetes control. Unfortunately, once you've had a vascular event, the risk of having a second event doesn't go back to where it was before. And this is because this reflects an underlying uh, process of atherosclerosis and in, in particular the di there's dysfunction of the endothelium and it, an increased propensity of that endothelium to become disrupted again. So for the next five years this risk remains about 7% per year, well ab above what we see in patients who have never had a heart attack. So frequently we're asked, what should we, our blood pressure be? What should our cholesterol be? Well, unfortunately it's a moving target and the guidelines are frequently changing. The national societies that put out guidelines can't even agree on what the blood pressure target should be, what the cholesterol target should be. And these change basically every three to five years. So for primary prevention, one hot topic is aspirin. Back in the 70s and 80s, it was thought that everyone should be on aspirin, typically over 40 or 50. It prevented heart attacks. Well, the school of thought on aspirin's changed in the last five years, particularly in uh, women, especially young women, and also in younger healthy diabetics. Clearly low risk patients should not be taking aspirin. And the reason is because the risk of out aspirin outweighs the benefit. The risk of aspirin is uh, related to bleeding, particularly to, through the development of ulcers. Intermediate risk patients, again, it really depends on where they fall in terms of their cardiovascular risk. For secondary prevention, it's a no-brainer. There's been 
study after study after study since the 1970s that showed clear benefit to aspirin or what's referred to as antiplatelet therapy to prevent clots from forming in these high-risk patients. So what about cholesterol? This is another question we get all the time. What should it be? Well, it really depends who you are. Looking at primary prevention patients, people who have never had a heart attack or stroke, you can see that they have a very low risk of having a vascular event, regardless of what their cholesterol is. Here are patients with an, this is an LDL cholesterol of 180, approximately 7%. Their total cholesterol would be much, much higher than this. That risk isn't all that much different than these patients down here. LDL cholesterol of 80 to 100, their risk is around 5% not that much different. So it's much more than just cholesterol. It's how all these risk factors interact. And once you've had a vascular event, a heart attack, a stroke, or peripheral vascular disease, the risk jumps substantially. And the risk of a second event is certainly much higher. So we tend to be much more aggressive with cholesterol lowering. And despite this, the risk doesn't go back down to where these patients were before they had their event. So other means to reduce cholesterol, fit, um, and there's a number of them. Uh, fish oil, and, and the, the main common theme I guess I want to emphasize on this slide, which, which has a lot on it, is that the outcome, outcome data, meaning a data to support that these measures will prevent a heart attack or stroke, is lacking. We think it works. There's good data that it reduces uh, cholesterol, whether it's triglycerides or LDL, the bad cholesterol. But actual data to support the fact that taking these medications is going to prevent a heart attack is not quite there yet. One of the most, probably one of the most beneficial agents is fish oil. Clearly lowers triglycerides. It has a variable effect on LDL. The commercial preparation of fish oil is Lovaza. And in some studies, it's been shown it may actually increase LDL, which is exactly what we don't want to do. This is your bad cholesterol. Frequently, when we see these patients, people are taking nowhere near the dose that, that's been studied to be effective for triglyceride lowering. The target dose is 3 to 6 grams per day. Most typically, this comes in uh, a preparation of anywhere from 300 to 1,000 milligrams. So if, if someone has a 1,000 milligram preparation, they need to basically take that three times a day. And achieving these doses is frequently limited by GI side effects, nausea, bloating, uh, things like that, diarrhea. For better or worse, statin medications have gotten a lot of bad publicity. They're clearly very effective at reducing an individual's risk for a heart attack or stroke. However, patients at times are reluctant to take these medications either because of perceived risks or actual side effects. One good alternative to statins is red yeast rice extract. This has been shown to lower LDL cholesterol and it basically has the same active, agree, active agree, ingredient excuse me, that's in lovastatin. The active ingredient uh, that's necessary to, um, it, the, I'm sorry, the amount of red yeast rice extract that needs to be taken per day is 2.4 grams per day to achieve a lovastatin dose of 5 milligrams. The lowest available dose of lovastatin that's commercially available is 10 milligrams. So the important thing to remember here that although this is good at lowering your LDL cholesterol, this is an extremely low dose of a statin medication. Other things that have been shown to lower cholesterol are a, a diet based in uh, soy, garlic, nuts, uh, plant sterols, which are um, basically cholesterols that come from plants. This is in margarine, many juices. So what about blood pressure? and hypertension. Well, hypertension is basically a diagnosis that needs to be made on three, a minimum of three and ideally more uh, separate assessments in the office. 
So this doesn't mean repeating the blood pressure three times in one office visit. This means three different office visits. The, important, the other important aspect about diagnosing hypertension is that the ambulatory blood pressure, the blood pressure that we get when you're checking the blood pressure at CVS or at home is the most predictive blood pressure for an individual's risk of having a vascular event. And one important piece of information that I wanted to share here is, again, getting back to high risk versus uh, high risk patients, secondary prevention versus primary prevention. The MRC trial looked at patients who smoked, were older than 55, and had a systolic blood pressure greater than 160. Treating the hypertension in these patients, only four patients were needed to be treated to prevent one cardiovascular event, prevent one heart attack, prevent one stroke. We only needed to see one or treat four of these people in the office and we prevented one event. Whereas if patients had mild hypertension and no risk factors, the number needed to treat to prevent one vascular event, 262. So again, the whole goal is prevention, not to have that first heart attack or first stroke. So how much does it really help to control your blood pressure, to control your cholesterol? Well, an average reduction of 12 to 13 points in your systolic blood pressure, the top number, over four years, leads to a 21% reduction in the risk for coronary disease, a 33% reduction in the risk for stroke, and a 13% reduction in all-cause mortality rates. Lower, it lowers your risk for dying. What about cholesterol control? A 10% decrease in total cholesterol levels, again, this is total, not LDL cholesterol, reduces the development of risk of developing coronary disease by almost 30%. This modest reduction can easily be achieved with diet and exercise. Which is a nice transition into exercise. What are the benefits of exercise? Well, it reduces reduction in body weight, reduction in blood, blood pressure, reduction in bad or LDL cholesterol, increase in good cholesterol, an increase in insulin sensitivity. Why this is important is because it reduces the risk for the development of a, me a metabolic syndrome uh, or the subsequent development of diabetes. And most importantly, people who exercise live longer. So what other options, what, what are the other options? We frequently get asked about vitamins. Well, most vitamins, the outcome data is lacking, but most vitamins aren't going to cause any harm. So my general, general recommendation is a multivitamin is safe. The one exception would be the lipid-soluble vitamins. These are vitamins that tend to accumulate in, in fats. Fats are lipids. These are, I'm sorry, vitamins A, D, and typically K. There's some data with vitamin E that particularly in high doses there may be an association with heart failure. What other therapies could be potentially dangerous? Well, particularly in patients who've had a heart attack, uh, NSAIDs, medications like ibuprofen and Aleve, clearly should not be taken. There's a number of reasons for this, but most importantly, these agents can block the action of aspirin. The role of uh, testosterone, um, as I said, this is a moving target. Clearly, patients who are def actually deficient in testosterone Supplementation is appropriate, but if the testosterone levels are normal, testosterone supplementation uh, can increase an individual's risk for having a heart attack. EDTA and chelation therapy is not generally recommended, but again, another moving target here. Historically, there is a risk of significant uh, kidney dysfunction in the development of irregular heart rhythms or arrhythmias with the use of EDTA or chelation therapy. However, there was a study performed in 2012 that showed a small possible benefit to this uh, treatment. There were a lot of concerns raised with this study, and one of the most concerning things was one in five people withdrew from the, the study uh, for a variety of reasons, which led to questions about the validity and safety of the trial. 
So moving on to diets, this is another hot topic that we get frequently get asked about in the office. What should we be eating? There's a gazillion diets out there uh, on the internet. The, the diet with the most data behind it in terms of the reduction in a risk for a cardiovascular event is a Mediterranean diet. There's not one Mediterranean diet out there that's necessarily better uh, than another. The concept here is it's a diet high in fruits, vegetables, grains, beans, nuts, and seeds. It includes olive oil and low to moderate wine consumption. Tough to argue with that. So this is a study looking at the Mediterranean diet. This is a European study looking at um, approximately 2,300 people aged 70 to 90 who have never had a cardiovascular event. And they were asked to do one of, one of four things. They found basically four groups. Either adopt a Mediterranean diet, increase their level of physical activity. This is consume, consume a moderate amount of alcohol and not smoke, four very, very simple things. They were followed for 10 years. Patients who adopted all four of these changes, very simple changes, had a 67% lower risk of cardiovascular mortality and a 65% lower risk of total mortality. This is dying from events other than uh, cardiovascular related events, things like cancer. And this is a, a figure depicting the outcome of the study. The solid line are patients who adopted all four lifestyle changes. Their mortality at four years, or at, I'm sorry, at 10 years is approximately 80%. Down here are people who adopted zero to one, right around 40 to 50%. A dramatic, dramatic reduction. So reducing your risk, it's a matter of priorities, but the most Risk reduction we see is when all the priorities are addressed. I didn't put a slide in here on uh, smoking and that was somewhat intentional because most of the questions come up on blood pressure, cholesterol, diabetes, but no one ever asks whether smoking is harmful. The problem with smoking is that it's a, a, a terrible addiction, but it clearly increases risk for a cardiovascular event. Cessation is ab an absolute must in patients who've had a heart attack or stroke. We've touched on exercise and physical activity. Weight loss is certainly important. Uh, blood sugar control and diabetics following a healthy diet. Um, aspirin in appropriate patients and daily alcohol. We generally don't encourage patients to drink. However, if you do drink alcohol, we do um, recommend uh, red wine. So this is a, a nice figure again from the Framing, Framingham Heart Study. This is old data, but a, a very re relevant to what we're talking about today. And this is looking at uh, a study, uh, women in the study, women who had isolated hypertension. You can see they had a very low risk of developing cardiovascular disease, regardless of what their blood pressure was. This is a range of systolic from 105 to 195. But as we start adding in high cholesterol, risk goes up. Add in glucose intolerance, which is a pre-diabetic state, risk goes up. Add in cigarettes, risk goes up. Add in, this is EKG LVH, this is thickening of the heart muscle, which is detected by an electrocardiogram, looking at the electrical activity in the heart. And this is basically another way of looking at whether someone has high blood pressure, or at least it was in the uh, mid 80s. <clears throat> risk goes up when you add in high blood pressure. What about HDL cholesterol? Well, this is the good cholesterol. So more is better. If you have a low HDL cholesterol, risk goes up. So the important thing to take away from this slide is that it's not any one risk factor that regulates uh, an individual's risk for having a cardiovascular event. All of the risk factors must be looked at. Yeah? It's cumulative. So they, what they did was they, they developed a risk model, and as you add in each, each factor, um, moving from left to right, the risk goes up. So getting back to how all these risk factors impact our arteries and lead to the development of atherosclerosis, well, this is a 
normal artery with a normal inner layer, the endothelium, the regulator of the health of the artery. And it regulates the vascular tone, how elastic the artery is, how well it accommodates changes to blood pressure, how well it um, re um, retards the interaction of platelets, the components of the blood that form blood clots. It inhibits the, uh, the endothelium inhibits the tendency for smooth muscle cells, which develop scar tissue, to enter the artery wall, enter the artery wall, and it forms a barrier to the bad cholesterol, the LDL cholesterol, getting into the artery wall. So how do these events occur? How does cholesterol get into the artery wall? How does it develop scar tissue? Well, it's through the development of dysfunctional endothelium. And what causes dysfunctional endothelium? Certainly the more cholesterol you have, the higher your risk is going to be to develop a plaque. High blood pressure places strain on the endothelium. Diabetes results in metabolic changes within the endothelium. And smoking basically makes this inner lining more porous to the cholesterol. The common pathways, you have endothelial dysfunction, resulting in a tendency for the blood vessels to clamp down on themselves and become constricted. It increases the, the tendency of this inner lining, the endothelium, to interact with the platelets, the clotting factors in the blood, which promote the formation of a blood clot or thrombus. Endothelial dysfunction leads to the recruitment of these smooth muscle cells, which come in and form scar tissue. And the endothelial dysfunction creates a vicious circle by which there's increased cholesterol deposition and reduced clearance of the cholesterol out of the artery wall. So how do we target these components of endothelial dysfunction? Well, the most important medications to combat this are the ACE inhibitors, which have vasodilatory properties, aspirin, which inhibits and prevents the formation of blood clots or thrombus, and statins, which limit smooth muscle cell migration and prevent cholesterol deposition within the artery wall. ACE inhibitors in a number of trials have also been uh, shown to help promote what's called angiogenesis, the formation of tiny new blood vessels uh, to replace these dysfunctional vessels. So a lot of things here to think about and uh, they all interact together to create a, a dysfunctional endothelium. But there's certainly a lot, a lot of factors that we don't understand very well. This is just one example of that. This is looking at fluid, um, fluid dynamic modeling and just basically using computational statistics. They look at the areas of the artery that based on its size and um, profile would be most likely to have shear stress. And what's been found that the areas of the artery that have the most shear stress are also the areas of the artery that are most prone to form what are called TICFAs, thin capped fibroatheromas. And these are blockages with a thin layer of scar tissue over them and are felt to be the blockages most likely, that are the most likely uh, to rupture and cause a heart attack. So certainly there's a lot we don't understand about heart disease and a number of risk factors are uh, well beyond our control. So I do want to close on an important topic. It's that time of year where a number of people are outside snow shoveling using their snow blowers. And here and throughout the state we're seeing a rise in the incidence of heart attacks. And this is because snow shoveling and using a snow blower places a great demand and stress on the cardiovascular system. This is from um, the website MLive, it just came out, what is this, February 4th, heart attacks from shoveling snow on the upswing, hospitals advise residents to take it easy. Clearly, snow shoveling, snow blowing will increase your risk for having a heart attack. Find someone to help you with that. <laughs> so just to conclude, atherosclerosis is a complex disease. It's the interaction of many, many risk factors resulting in endothelial dysfunction, which is the main common pathway that leads to vascular disease. And vascular disease is really a systemic syndrome um, and not just an isolated event in the heart or the peripheral vasculature.
Any questions? Sure, that, that's an excellent question. Um, there are ten, probably 10 to 12 statin medications out there. And in terms of thinking about prescribing a statin medication, um, the, the two things that I, I think about are, are outcomes and availability. So the most outcome data, I think, supports the use of atorvastatin, uh, which used to be called Lipitor. It's now generic. And the other medication that's been shown to be highly uh, effective is Crestor or Resuvastatin, which is uh, still under a trade name, Crestor. Um, so that comes to the second issue of availability and cost. Uh, Torvastatin is uh, now generic and widely available and very well tolerated. So that's, that's generally the one I, I go to uh, first. Um, in terms of efficacy, they're both very similar. Um, Crestor seems to be the most well tolerated of any statin, but it does come with a price. It seems to be the most poorly covered by insurance companies. And then, um, like I said, there's probably another eight statins that are available, and they have kind of niche um, indications. Does that help? Can you switch from one to another? Or is that Absolutely. Yep. Does the dosage change when you split from one to another? Uh, yes, it does. The the dosages are not interchangeable, and the, the potencies are completely different, meaning how much they're going to lower your cholesterol. So you might take 40, um, 20 milligrams of atorvastatin, but might require 80 milligrams of fluvastatin. So certainly stress plays a role. It's been something that's been real hard to study and real hard to get a handle on. Um, but it, it's thought to lead clearly to endothelial dysfunction. We all have stress. It's very hard. It's a very hard variable to measure and, and evaluate um, because people uh, perceive stress different ways. We have stress every day. And to clearly show that there's a causal relationship to a heart attack has, has been, or stroke, uh, has been very difficult to do, but uh, there's clearly some association with the development of uh, endothelial dysfunction and the development of atherosclerosis. The question is what dose of diuretic should be given for high blood pressure? So there, there's very dire, various diuretics available, um, and that, that's really done on an individual basis because what diuretics do are they basically remove fluid from the body and not all hypertension is, is mediated by fluid retention. So that's really an individualized um, treatment. And there's a number of diuretics that can be used. And it, it's very difficult to answer that question without knowing the specific situation. That's a hot topic. So the fatty streak that develops in the first 10, maybe the 20 years, before it penetrates into the uh, inner layers of the artery wall, well, that, that fat and inflammatory reaction still sitting on the inner lining, that's all thought to be reversible. Once the plaque starts to form, it's probably a largely non-reversible process. And this is a diffuse process that's occurring throughout the body in all the blood vessels to varying degrees. So even if there might be regression in one spot, it doesn't mean there's not progression in another spot. And uh, it's been tried, there's been numbers, a number of studies that try to look at it in a number of ways. And it, it's also a very hard thing to get a handle on because it's such a diffuse process. One example would be when we, as an interventional cardiologist, I look at a patient's heart arteries. And we look at them using simple x-rays. And by x-ray, an individual's artery may look very, very good. But for a variety of reasons, we may put an ultrasound probe down the artery um, and find that the artery, although it looks very good and has no narrowings, diffusely has a very thin or thick layer of diffuse atherosclerosis. So it's been a v determining whether atherosclerosis comes and goes um, has been a very difficult topic um, to really get a handle on. I I'm a bit skeptical that the process is actually reversed. I think what we do is stabilize the condition. Prevention. 
Yeah, and, and that's really the theme I was trying to get through is that the, the, the most important thing is to pr prevent that first event because once the first event occurs, there seems to be a, a general propensity of, of the, the, to have a second event. And it, it probably is related to the underlying disease process that's occurring throughout the body, this endothelial dysfunction. And it's just identifying a group of people who have more significant dysfunction. That milk causes inflammation. I, I'm, I'm not aware that it causes inflammation. There's a, a lot of things that have been uh, thought to promote the formation of atherosclerosis, and there's a lot of different things that are out there on the internet. I, you know, I'd be happy to look at that with you after we're done here. Um, but I, I think for the majority of these, when they've been scientifically looked at, um, that, that hasn't been the case. And what, one hot topic, I mentioned this earlier, is these diets. There's a lot out there on the internet about heart-healthy diets. And people have a lot of different opinions. But you really need to be careful about what you read on the internet. Look at it critically. Look at the data supporting it. Look at how it's funded. And look at whether they're just as simple as whether they're selling anything. A patient asked me about a week ago about a diet and what my thoughts were on the diet. And actually, I'd never heard of the diet. So that night, I went home and looked it up on the internet. And it was run by a family. And they um, offered um, basically uh, training courses at a variety of sites where you paid thousand, thousands of dollars to go learn about a diet. Um, and there was absolutely no data, or out, especially outcome data, except testimonials from people who went through the, to the course. So I mean, I, I think they're very well-intentioned people. They're promoting a healthy diet. But the, um, the motives and the, um, data supporting what they're recommending recommending is lacking. So.